Hi there, I'm Nathan. I did the Disney College program. From August 16th, 2021 through January 6th, 2022, I was at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida, where I worked at Mission Space, an attraction at Epcot. And now that my program's finished and I'm back at college, I've got some thoughts about the whole thing. So with four months, 21 days, and six hours, give or take a few minutes of experience under my belt, I'd like to give you a brutally honest review and rundown of the Disney College program as of fall 2021. And if you're wondering what makes this video different than other videos talking about the college program, now, I get it. You're a busy student and you just want to know if this program's any good or not. You don't have time to watch a 30-some minute video detailing every single aspect of the program. You just want to know if you should do it. Well, for those of you that don't want to watch this video in its entirety, I have two things. First off, you're making me very sad. And second, here's the dude too long didn't care to watch. Just wait to do the program. There are better options in the meantime. Okay, uh, you, can, you can go now. For everybody else though, I've got two quick disclaimers before we start diving in. Disclaimer number one. This is my first program. Sort of. While it's the third time I've applied for the Disney College program, it's the first time I actually got in. I did get the chance to meet lots of CPs who had done the program in prior years, and I'll be drawing on a lot of their experiences in later sections of this video. But since I don't have any experience outside of applications with the Disney College program prior to 2021, I can't speak personally as to what those things are like. Number two, this video won't be talking about the college program at Disneyland or the international college program, because one, they aren't back as of this video, and two, I have literally no idea what they're like. And with those two disclaimers out of the way, let's jump right in. Welcome to Flamingo Crossings Village, conveniently located right next to the Walt Disney World, and absolutely nothing else. There's two pools! The nearest Walmart is a 15 minute drive away. With tolls, we have a fitness center. Rent starts at $175 a week. Okay, I'm making fun, but honestly, life at Flamingo isn't that bad. When my program started, Flamingo wasn't that great. The area around Flamingo was under construction, and a lot of it still is, but there have been things added in the area since that have made it feel a little bit less deserted. There's a Walgreens, the world's third smallest target, signs for a Domino's and a Starbucks that still haven't opened. On the apartment side of things, you'll get to share a living space with four other CPs. During my program, rent costs $175 for a two-bedroom, two-bathroom apartment, $185 for a four-bedroom, two-bathroom apartment, and $205 for a four-bedroom, four-bathroom apartment. These rent prices were weekly, not monthly. And the rent has gone up since my program ended, but I'm not quite sure by how much. I'm going to say something a little unpopular here. But while rent at Flamingo sounds pretty steep, I'd argue that the prices make a lot of sense. Not only does your apartment come fully furnished, but Flamingo Crossings Village has a lot of amenities to make that price seem a bit more reasonable. There's two pools, both with hot tubs. The entire complex has security. There's a community center that features conference rooms, 24-hour complex support, an incredible gym. So I've been told I've never personally stepped in there myself. And best of all, a 24-hour service window where you can check out things like cleaning supplies or even video game consoles to take back and use at your apartment. Rent is steep, yes, but if you're willing to take advantage of everything that Flamingo has to offer, it can seem a little bit less so. But if you're anything like me, you probably won't, which will make the rent seem super steep. Flamingo also offers bus transportation to the different parts of Walt Disney World so that CPs can get to work. Now, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I have heard a rumor that these buses were originally supposed to be run by Disney themselves, but due to staffing issues, they had to turn to a third-party service. Either way, with the bus system comes... issues. I consider myself lucky. Since I worked at Epcot, my bus route was a direct line between Flamingo Crossings Village and Epcot Cast Services that left every 20 minutes. Other routes weren't so lucky. When my program started, the route that went to Hollywood Studios first went to the Caribbean Beach Resort, then Pop Century Cast Services, then the Pop Century Resort, then the Art of Animation Resort, before finally stopping at Hollywood Studios. This meant that if you were one of the many CPs who worked at that park, you would have to get on a bus over an hour before your shift started, then go to four different locations where maybe one CP would get off before finally arriving at Hollywood Studios. 
They split this route into two separate ones in mid-October. But the biggest issue I heard from other CPs about the bus routes was their inconsistency. Bus drivers would often leave a stop several minutes ahead of the scheduled time, which could leave CPs waiting 15, 20, or even 30 minutes for the next bus to arrive. If a bus was full, standing room was almost never allowed, which meant that when large groups of CPs got off work, about half of them would have to wait for the next bus to arrive. And that's without taking into account how long a CP waiting at a further stop on the route might have to wait. But what about just driving to work? Well, strap in, my friend, because for me, no greater issue arose than having to deal with the bus system than having to deal with my car. Allow me to introduce you to... Part 1 B and Long Winded Saga of Satellite Parking. When I first got accepted to the Disney College program, I had two options for my car. Option 1, purchase a parking pass. These are available on a first come, first serve basis and cost $80 for the parking pass and $25 for the decal. Option 2 was to park at Satellite Parking which was listed as a quote, five to 10 minute walk away. Now, seeing as how I wanted to park at Flamingo, I opted to try and secure a parking pass. However, by the time I had been accepted, all the parking passes were sold out, so I'd have to park in satellite. A few weeks before my program started, I got an email with information about what my move-in date would look like. While satellite parking was no longer listed as a 5-10 to 10 minute walk away, the email did mention that I'd be in satellite parking, which would be, quote, accessible by complimentary shuttle. On my move-in day, I found out that I'd be parking at Typhoon Lagoon. And that complimentary shuttle the email talked about? It was a single bus. This made it even more annoying when the bus driver would leave early, because it meant that you'd be waiting half an hour for a 15 minute ride back to Flamingo. Because we parked in satellite parking, we weren't able to use the parking lot at Flamingo at all, even if we wanted to drop off groceries for say five minutes. This meant that if you wanted to buy groceries, you would have to get on the bus, take the bus to Typhoon Lagoon, get in your car, drive to Walmart, buy your groceries, drive back, pull into the parking lot right as the bus was starting to leave, dang it, wait 30 minutes for the bus to return, get on the bus, take the 15 minute bus ride back to Flamingo, walk all of your groceries back to your apartment complex just to unpack everything and realize that your ice cream melted along the way. And it's not like there weren't parking spots available. Some of the CPs who had gotten to Flamingo before my arrival date had already finished their programs, either because they'd done some incredibly dumb thing and gotten fired, or because they'd gotten fed up with the program and had quit. So for all of us CPs who were parked on the opposite side of Walt Disney World, seeing these open parking spots that we couldn't use was infuriating. Those spots would remain open until early September, when Disney would send an email that would start to change everything. Because enough CPs had left the program, Disney was able to offer not one, but two events to give CPs the opportunity to purchase a parking pass. We could win this rare and exclusive opportunity by signing up for one of two events. An online raffle, where if your name was drawn, you get to purchase a parking pass, or by showing up to an in-person balloon pop, where if you popped a winner, you could purchase a pass. The balloon pop was an absolute disaster. People showed up that didn't sign up for the event. People popped multiple balloons at a time. The event was badly organized because the people running it didn't know what was going on. And the cherry on top, everybody that lost in the balloon pop got entered in the online raffle. Guess which one I signed up for? Now, while I may not have won a parking pass, this email had a silver lining. CPs who were parked at Typhoon Lagoon could obtain temporary parking passes to park at Flamingo Crossings Village. Mind you, the passes could only be obtained between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. You could only use the pass for three hours at a time, and you'd have to leave your driver's license at the security gate in order to park in the parking lot. But it was the start. And so my wallet stayed $105 for, and my car stayed mostly parked at Typhoon until the last week in September when Disney sent us an email telling us that we had four days to move our cars from Typhoon Lagoon to Blizzard Beach. The singular shuttle would serve both locations during the switch, and after those four days were up, it wouldn't go back to Typhoon Lagoon. So on Sunday, September 29th, I took the bus to Typhoon Lagoon, picked up my car, drove to work at Epcot, worked, finished my shift, then drove my car to park at Blizzard Beach, and arrived just as the bus was pulling out of the parking lot. After parking my car, I checked to see when the next bus would arrive, and saw that it would be arriving in 45 minutes. 
While the experience of moving my car from Typhoon Lagoon to Blizzard Beach was a pain, Blizzard Beach wasn't actually that bad of a place to park. Instead of a 15 minute bus ride, it was now only about 7 or 8. Instead of parking in dimly lit tree filled woods, it was now a brightly lit parking lot. And since I was actually closer to Flamingo Crossing's village, I didn't even try to apply when Disney released another batch of parking passes for CPs to purchase. Unlike the horrors that were the Balloon Pop event, Disney seemed to have learned their lesson by now and just released the passes on a first come first served basis. They were gone in under a minute, so my wallet stayed reasonably full and my car stayed parked at Blizzard Beach. Until December 22nd, when Disney sent us another email. Since Disney was expecting large amounts of people at Blizzard Beach during the holiday season, CPs now had to move their cars back to Typhoon Lagoon. Oh, and we had to have it done by midnight December 25th. Merry Christmas! Screw yourselves! Disney! So on Christmas Eve, I finished my shift at Epcot and parked my car back at Typhoon Lagoon, where it would stay until January 5th, 2022, where I would drive my car to Flamingo Crossings Village, park in the parking lot, load it up with all of my stuff, and then immediately check out of my apartment and the Disney College program the next morning. Also, I discovered in November that CEPs who arrived in June or July, if they had proof of COVID-19 vaccination, got their parking pass for free. The end. Now, luckily for you, this story might never happen again. Disney seems to have learned their lesson with satellite parking, and as of spring 2022, if you aren't able to purchase a parking pass to Flamingo when you get your acceptance, you just can't bring your car to Flamingo. So on the one hand, you may not have to deal with any of the horrors that I've just mentioned. On the other, you better hope that your roommate has a car if you want to get out of the Disney bubble. I'm just gonna come out and say this. The events for the Disney College program kind of suck. Prior to 2021, the Disney College program offered classes. These would be an hour a week for about a month and would be taught at Disney University by Disney professionals on a variety of different subjects. Pretty cool, right? Well, this year, the classes were replaced with events. Instead of being taught at Disney University, they'd be taught over Zoom. Instead of being an hour a week for a month, the same hour-long class would be offered multiple times over the month. And instead of different subjects taught by Disney professionals, the only one I kept seeing was, here's how to build a resume. Every single month. Outside of those classes, Disney offered other events to CPs in the activities calendar. These could range from, we're making trails mix in the breezeway, to here's a block party with food, character meet and greets, and more. And the balloon pop event, but you've already heard about that. So if you couldn't tell, most of the events were kind of garbage. Now, there were a few events that were actually pretty cool. However, these came with their own challenges. The most popular ones were their Discovering the Story events. These were basically a backstage tour of a different land or attraction. And during my program, these would be either a tour of one of the different lands at Animal Kingdom, or a backstage tour of the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror ride at Disney's Hollywood Studios. If you signed up, you'd get to go into said land slash attraction very early in the morning before the park opened and take a backstage tour of that land slash attraction, learning about the design details that went into it, the storytelling aspects behind it, etc, etc. The tours were pretty cool, except for one small thing. These tours were designed for small groups of cast members, not large groups of CPs. As a result, the sign-up limit for these events was tiny. As in, 15 people tiny. They also seemed to offer no more than four in any given month, which meant that if you wanted to go to one, you'd better have lightning fast internet and one of the fastest mice clicks in the West. Mice clicks? Mouse clicks. I don't know. Now, probably the most important thing about events is that unlike the classes that were offered in the past, if you signed up to go to one, you had to coordinate your own time off with your location to attend, which makes sense, because you don't want CPs calling out of work just to go party. But it does start to get annoying when every block party event starts 30 minutes after your shift begins and ends 15 minutes before you can clock out. And this scheduling leads me into the most important part of the Disney College program, part three your location. When it comes to the Disney College program, your location will make 
or break your experience. In past years, Disney would give you an option on your application to indicate preferences for where you wanted to work. However, that is now a thing of the past. Outside of a couple of questions indicating if you're comfortable with lifeguarding or if you have a valid driver's license or not, there's no way to indicate that you want to work somewhere specific. So if you get accepted to the Disney College program, you could be working anywhere at Walt Disney World. You could be serving Dole Whips in Adventureland or taking photographs on the streets of Hollywood. You could be helping guests to fly on a banshee or changing bedsheets at the Contemporary Resort. And almost every aspect of your program, from how much you get paid each week to how much free time you have, will be entirely determined by that location. Let's start with the money, because everybody wants to know how much you'll get paid while at Disney World. Well, I can tell you how much you'll get paid each hour. As of spring 2022, CPs make $14 an hour, with certain roles such as the Main Street Emporium and Housekeeping making slightly more. Your paycheck will be entirely determined by how many hours you get each week. Now, while CPs are required to have a minimum amount of hours scheduled, you know, enough to cover your rent for that week, there isn't a maximum. So yes, you will be working. A lot. However, your location ultimately determines how many hours you get, which means you might be making barely enough to cover rent or getting so many hours that you never go a week without working overtime. To help better explain this, I'll use the four guys in my apartment as an example. Each one of us worked at a different location, and during the week of Christmas, our schedules looked dramatically different. Jake, who worked custodial at Animal Kingdom, got scheduled 36 hours over six days. Luke, who also worked custodial, got scheduled 38 hours over six days. Bryce, who worked at Woody's Lunchbox in Hollywood Studios, got scheduled 42 hours over five days. He was given Christmas Eve and day off. We still have no idea how that happened. As for myself, working at Mission Space, I got scheduled 61 and a half hours over six days, with my one day off being December 23rd. And compared to some of the other CPs at Mission Space, I was one of the lucky ones that week. Another CP who worked there got scheduled 75 hours. Not only does your location determine how many hours you'll get scheduled each week, but how your location treats CPs will determine how much flexibility you'll have with your schedule. If you want to try and make it to an event, your location will ultimately determine if you can go or not. Requesting that day off in advance could work, but your request may get denied because part and full-timers take priority. And while you can try and trade shifts with your coworkers, depending on what that shift looks like, you might not be able to get rid of it. Especially since CP shifts don't qualify for sixth day or holiday pay. Two major incentives for part and full-timers who want to trade shifts. As a second example, take the CP program celebration, which ran from 8 p.m. till midnight on Monday, November 29th. Rides were open, there was free food, characters were out for meet and greets, and the entire park was only open to CPs as a way to celebrate them and their program. And just like every other event, if you wanted to go, you had to coordinate time off with your location. This might not have been an issue, if not for the fact that Epcot, a park with huge CP presence, had extended hours for resort guests that evening and was open till midnight. Which meant that if you were a CP at Epcot, you had to pray that you didn't get a closing shift that night. Or that your coworkers would be willing to trade your 6.30pm to 12.30am shift. For some locations, that was easy. As an example, all 22 of the CPs at Soren got scheduled that night. However, Every single one of them was able to trade or give away their shift to a part or full-time cast member. In comparison, while all 12 of the CPs at Mission Space were scheduled that evening, only two of us were actually able to trade away our shifts. And while five CPs were able to get off early, they weren't able to clock out until 11.15. And the other five CPs weren't able to get off at all. But while our location didn't have it that great, we could have had it a lot worse. See, while it's one thing to be working the night of your CP celebration, it's another thing entirely to be working your CP celebration. And for every land that was open at Animal Kingdom that night, there were CPs working there. Asia had CPs working at Expedition Everest. Dinoland USA had CPs working at Dinosaur and the Midway Games. Discovery Island had CPs working at Custodial. And in Pandora, Every single CP that worked at Satuli Canteen was there that night, because none of the part or full-timers would trade those shifts away. 
When I say your location will make or break your college program, I mean it. Many of the CPs I talked to who left early quit specifically because of how bad their location was. And since there's no way to request a transfer into a different location, you either stick it out and hope things get better, or get fed up and quit. But here's the thing, no matter how bad your location is, no matter how many 40 plus hour work weeks you get scheduled, your program can still be absolutely fantastic. Because while almost every other part of the Disney College program can be absolute garbage, the Disney part is one of the most magical things ever. Welcome to Kite Tales, your free show is one kite. I'm sorry, two kites. It might sound like I've been harsh on the Disney College program so far. I have been. But that isn't to say that the program is complete garbage. Both Jake and Luke extended their programs through summer of 2022, and Bryce transferred to a part-time role working at Port Orleans. Heck, I'd probably still be down there if I didn't come back to college and have to finish my degree. Because even though you're a CP, you're still a cast member at Walt Disney World. And there are benefits to that. The most obvious example is complimentary admission. Since you are a cast member, you get in the parks for free. Now, block out dates still apply, so good luck getting in on Christmas Eve, but if you want to go to the parks in the morning then go to work in the afternoon, that's something you can do. Not only that, but having a blue cast member ID gives you tons of benefits. You can get into Cast Connections, the on-property store that's only available to cast members. You can get discounts on some food and merchandise in the parks, or find discounted tickets to concert shows and events through the cast website. And best of all, there are cast member exclusive events, from chances to win backstage tours, to early morning yoga in front of the castle, to cast member previews of rides and shows. A few weeks after I started my program, Epcot started holding cast member previews for Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, the new ride that would be opening on October in Epcot. And on the last day of training, myself, the two other CPs who were being trained, and our trainees all finished our shift by going over and riding the ride, still in our costumes from work. In fact, some of the coolest experiences me and my friends got to have was because we were cast members at Disney. Not because we were CPs. Because the leaders at Animal Kingdom Custodial organized backstage tours for their cast, my roommate Jake got to take backstage tours of both the Tower of Terror and the Haunted Mansion. Because the people who run fireworks at Epcot clock out the Mission Space break room, my coworker Gabby was able to get a shift on the opening night of Epcot's new show, Harmonious. Because my friend Brooke was a cast member, she got to audition and perform in the Epcot cast choir during the Festival of the Holidays. And because I I talked with the people that work next door to me, I gotta check out the Space 220 restaurant the week it opened. While I was on a break! Even outside of Disney, there's a lot of incredible benefits. After all, you're in Orlando, Florida. Since you're technically a Florida resident, you can get an annual pass to Universal Studios for a lot cheaper than you if you lived out of state. If you want to take a day off work to drive to the beach, it'll be an hour or two at most. And that's not even counting all the different activities, events, and places in and around Orlando that you can explore and discover just because you live in the area. And while the Disney College program can be rough, there are some advantages that come with doing it. Because when Disney does the college program right, it can be incredible. I was lucky enough to experience the Discovering the Story Tour for Africa at Animal Kingdom and getting to walk around before the park opened and learned about the different storytelling and design elements that made that land come to life was incredible. I was able to attend the CP celebration in its entirety. And let me tell you, experiencing Animal Kingdom surrounded by people who love the parks just as much as you do made the entire experience a joy. In fact, the cast members at Dinosaur were even running the ride with the lights on during the last half hour of the event. I may or may not have footage of the entire ride through. Members at Walt Disney Imagineering hosted an event for CPs that not only helped us to get a better understanding of what goes on at WDI, but also gave us a chance to experience rides, learn from, and network with those same Imagineers. But best of all, when you become a CP, you immediately become part of this group of young adults that shares the same passion and excitement about being there that you do. You get to make friends with them, laugh with them, share experiences with them, etc, etc, blah, 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 blah. The point is, you become part of a community of people who love Disney and their parks. 
and that makes the entire experience a lot better. Yeah, my program did kind of suck, but the people I got to meet and connect with during my college program made the experience that much more amazing. So now comes the big question. Should you do the Disney College program? My answer? Maybe. I know, I know, it sounds like a cop-out, but honestly, your opinion shouldn't be swayed by one guy with a super long video. Overall, the college program is a mixed bag in terms of quality, especially depending on where you get placed, so no two experiences will be quite the same. As such, I can't really give you a definite answer as to if you should do the program or not, but I can offer you some advice for people that are trying to decide. If you're wanting to use the Disney College program to jumpstart a career path with the Walt Disney Company, skip out on the Disney College program entirely and instead apply for a Disney professional internship. They're more career specific, pay slightly higher, and most importantly, give you a huge leg up on building a lasting career with the company. Many of the cast members I spoke with who didn't work in the parks mentioned a professional internship as a way to help jumpstart their career. And while experience with guests at a theme park might look good on a resume, experience in a specific career field looks a whole lot better. If you're wanting to do the Disney College program, give it some time before you apply. Fall 2021 was the first time the Disney College program happened after the COVID-2020 shutdown. In fact, the very first groups of CPs that fall had either been doing a program or had been offered a program in 2020, but had their programs canceled due to COVID-19. Between this and the fact that Disney is still getting a lot of their full and part-time staff back from COVID-19 layoffs, many of the issues that I talked about scheduling, classes, transportation issues, etc. could simply be a result of those COVID setbacks. Waiting a little bit before you apply would give you the chance to see which issues persist and which ones were just a side effect of 2020. And if you've listened to all of this and decide that you still want to apply for a program, good for you. I hope your program goes fantastically well and I want to give you some advice just to make it a little bit better. First, find out how your location trades shifts between cast members as soon as your program starts. The sooner you can get a jump on that system, the more control you'll have with your schedule further down the line. Two, learn the cast member website, especially when it comes to calling out and requesting days off. If you can work the website, it'll not only make your work life easier, but you'll also discover some nice cast benefits along the way. Three, find ways to escape the Disney bubble. It can be tough, especially if you don't have a car, but find ways to take breaks from Disney and theme parks entirely if possible. Not only will it help with your mental health, but it'll give you the chance to discover Orlando and the area around it. One wheel drive, move it. So, there you have it. A brutally honest review of the Fall 2021 Disney College program. While I'm not planning on doing the college program again, at least not in its current state, I don't regret doing it. It was hectic, it was fun, it was infuriating, it was fantastic. It gave me memories, and two name tags. And while I'm more than happy to have finished my program, I'm still incredibly glad that I did it. Overall, six out of 10, needed more mouse. I hope somebody notices the Mickey Mouse ears on the couch. I specifically put them so there'd be something on the wall. It's not just the clock that you can barely see in the frame.